Why Stan Shumpike was never under the Imperious Curse. So I'm not naive enough to believe that I'm the only person who still constantly listens or reads or watches Harry Potter. For me, it's Stephen Fry's audiobooks. God bless that man. I will complete the last chapter of book 7 and go to the first book as though the story never ended. So why am I making this video? I'm not actually sure. Well I know how it came to be, but in essence the video is pointless and it's just me rambling and overanalyzing a character easily forgotten by most casual audiences. The story of this video starts when I was walking home after a lovely 13 hour shift at my current job. I grab some McDonald's, put my earphones on, and pick up where I left off. Which was chapter 3, the night bus in book 3, The Prisoner of Azkaban. I get one third home and my phone dies having nowhere to charge it or work, so I'm left alone with my thoughts in the pitch black, and the last scene to be listened to was Stan carrying Harry's trunks into the leaky cauldron after being caught by Fudge getting off the night bus, and by the way, why the hell is the Minister of Magic doing that kind of job himself, but I guess... That's another pointless video for me to overanalyze. So I'm left thinking about Stan for two thirds of my journey. Admittedly, the hundreds of other times I've listened to this, I've never really considered Stan as a character worthy of much thought, except detailing Harry the whole plotline of book three in a very simple paragraph, and to make people have a connection to one of the adversaries flying after Harry in the beginning of book seven, where Harry is being chased from Privet Drive, further deepening Voldemort's play into the wizarding world. But I consider Stan for a little while, and with this I hereby present this video. Now, as I said before, this video in essence is pointless, and overanalyzing. What I have come to understand is that most writers of notable fame never intentionally put this much depth into things. It's our ability to captivate far more than just a scene with words that allow us to pour out over someone's work for years after heralding them the next Shakespeare. But again, that's another video if I bother to make such an opinionated and crass topic video. I consider Stan Chumpike, who at first time we meet him at Harry's estimate 18 or 19, a young hooligan making the wrong kind of choices, much like Hagrid being expelled at 13. I know, I know, he wasn't the actual culprit, but his actions got him expelled anyway, so. He's only one of the few examples of a middle class kind of wizard in the Harry Potter universe. There are some others come to think of it. Tom the Barman, Aberforth, Ernie Prang the night bus driver to name a few. But to me, Stan is fresh out of school and into full time employment. Whether it's a meantime job or not, I don't think so personally. But again, this is a void we fill in ourselves. From the get-go, the way he talks stands out from a very formal speech we know from most other wizards and witches. He uses slang and lacks any professional manner, especially working in hospitality, which is what I do as a job. But I stumbled across the phrase which led me to make this video in a process of thought is, How come the muggles don't hear the bus, said Harry. Them, said Stan contemptuously. Don't listen properly, do they? Don't look properly either. Never notice nothing, they don't. Now the first thing that stands out to me is the word contemptuously, defined by Google means in a scornful way that shows disdain. This kind of opinion, especially in the wizarding world, is usually met with Death Eaters and Purebloods, who despise non-magic people, which shine some light over Stan. Again, analysis warning, which I guess you could turn to Stan's own position. If he was a critic of himself, which I believe that he is, he could be inwardly hating his whole predicament, how life turned out for him. That is quite a leap, but if you think about what he does for a living, his whole outlook on life in general is kind of bleak destined to carry other wizard trunks on and off a bus and to check tickets. This little quote got me thinking about the last time we see him when he gets unmasked in the chase sequence after Harry gets to safety in book 7. He talks about Stan, about his obvious escape from prison and on the whole, Stan is just a troubled kid who made the wrong decisions but what I don't think is that he was under the Imperius curse. Moving on from that is another little nudge towards Stan's character. It's the fact that J.K. Rowling writes a few times about Stan's fascination with famous witches and wizards. He gets excited finding out Harry's true identity and finding the Minister for Magic waiting at the Leaky Cauldron. He's very knowledgeable about Black's whole history as written presumably by the Daily Prophet in which he has on him in this scene. J.K. Rowling even writes as Harry's thoughts. He couldn't help imagining what Stan might be telling his passengers in a few nights time. Hear about that Harry Potter? Blow up his aunt, we had him here on the night bus didn't we Ern? This tells us that Stan likes a bit of gossip and also doesn't know when to give away too much information, but if you couple that with my previous point about Stan understanding that he is a kind of a nobody and fascinates on people that are notable enough to be in the Daily Prophet, which I'm guessing he reads a lot based on his black story accuracy from a bystander's perspective, you could make that leap where he maybe wants to go up in the world and make a name for himself. Because I believe the next time Stan Chumpike is mentioned with any character growth it is Rufus Scrimger saying that he was arrested for alleged Death Eater connections or information about Death Eater plans, which Harry chalks up to the fact that Stanley is a loudmouth, in which the minister quickly gets rid of him because of it. Also, back when Harry was escaping his aunt and uncle's house, 
Fudge also gets rid of them there too. I do want to mention his part with the Vila in the Woods because from any time a character's willpower is tested in these books, it is the character with flaws and weaknesses of desire that really tell us what kind of disposition the character has. For example, Ron wanted to get more time in front of the mirror of Erised, or Stan lying about becoming the next Minister for Magic to the Vila, or Harry as the only one able to throw off the Imperious Curse. I also want to mention Stan's appearance as well. I don't think it has really any sway with the character, but if you compare him to Death Eaters of very shabby appearances, Fenrir or any other Death Eater really, and if you compare him to any shabby characters we know are good, like Mr. Weasley or Lupin, in comparison they look much cleaner, even though in the books they aren't, so I'm only half mentioning this. So what happened between book 3 and book 7? Well, four years pass as Harry had just turned 13 at the time, so we first meet Stan in the beginning of book 7. Harry is just about 17, so Stan, if we give his age of 18 or 19 at that time, he's now 22 or 23. An adult now, but is still presumably in the same dead-end job with no kind of prospects or future. Now again, over-analysis on my part as we can only guess at what the character is actually doing because we know for a fact that Daily Prophet is a biased newspaper. The case might not at all have been Stan getting arrested for giving out Death Eater secrets. He could have instead been recruited as we very well know. Stan is well aware of the current times as he likes to be in the loop of things by reading the Daily Prophet. If we couple that with the events that by now the Prophet has actually stated that Voldemort has returned, Stan might very well have picked up on the fact that he is back now. I'm going to quote Hagrid from Book 1 here to best sum up what I think happened to Stan, and also Pettigrew as well. Started looking for followers, got them too. Some were afraid, some just wanted a bit of his power. In the context of Stan, you could assume that maybe Stan saw an opportunity to make a name for himself in the revolution he saw coming. Coupled with the fact that his opinions, however mild, aligned with Death Eater ideals and also his own predicament of job and success. Maybe he even wanted wanted to see his own name in the paper he reads whilst conducting the night bus. Maybe he saw an opening. So on the night he was arrested, I think that actually he either talked loudly on purpose to get noticed by the right people, and whilst he was in Azkaban, he got Death Eater contacts and enlisted in Voldemort's army to join the ranks of the rebellion overthrowing the Statue of Secrecy. Or maybe this happened because he went to prison for lying about Death Eater plans. Or maybe he was already recruited and accidentally talked about his dealings with Death Eaters. Either way, I believe he joined Voldemort's ranks of his own free will much the better tragic path for our sub-character. This paints a lovely grey area with him. At this point, I could write a whole fan story about Tragic Stan's descent into darkness, but I really can't be bothered, but it would be cool if one of my listeners to my ramble could. Now at this point, I have reread the chase scene, and J.K. Rowling has stated that he had a glazed look, which is a characteristic symptom of the Imperius Curse, which kind of blows the whole thing out of the war. I'm not going to bother counter-arguing something that is written by the universe creator herself, but what I will say is that a bonus to the tragic story, he could have had a glazed look, realising he has attempted to kill someone he thought was a genuinely good person for something he doesn't fully believe in, and that all he was trying to do was make a name for himself in the end. I hope you enjoyed this absolutely poorly researched rambly mess, and if you did, feel free to tell me your events of Stan's tragic downfall in the comments below. And that is me. Peace.